This episode 23 is the first of two parts that discuss the definition of supporting organizations as a special type of public charity. All supporting organizations must pass four tests, an organizational test, an operational test, a control test, and a relationship test. Supporting organizations are further classified as type 1, type 2, or type 3 supporting organizations based on how they satisfy the relationship test. In this episode, I'll cover the basic requirements that apply to all three types and the additional rules for type 1 and type 2. Type 3 will be covered in more detail in the next episode. So join me now for a dive into the supporting organization rules. Welcome to the EO Radio Show your nonprofit legal resource brought to you by the exempt organizations group at Ferella Braun and Martell. My name is Cynthia Rowland and I'm a partner at Ferella. I'm a business and tax lawyer with more than 30 years of experience advising clients on nonprofit and charity law. Through this podcast, our lawyers and guests will discuss a range of legal and business issues impacting the nonprofit world because we understand you work hard every day to make your community a better place to live and do business. Many of our programs focus on the basics and at times we'll do a deep dive into narrow and complicated legal issues. Again, welcome to the EO Radio Show. We're glad you're here. Let's start our discussion of supporting organizations with a little history. In 1969, Congress enacted major changes to the tax laws and introduced the stringent private foundation rules. So that meant that the consequences of being treated as a private foundation became quite significant. To soften the impact on organizations that were closely associated with but separately organized from recognized public charity type organizations, Congress adopted these special rules for supporting organizations. The organizations of concern here could not qualify as public charities for a variety of reasons. These types of organizations, as an example, might manage funds or activities or generate receipts from related activities to the extent that would disqualify them as publicly supported organizations under the public charity rules of Internal Revenue Code sections 509A1 and 509A2. On the other hand, these types of organizations were closely linked to recognized public charities and often performed important services or functions that were integral to the exempt purpose or function of the related charity. So, Section 509A3 of the Internal Revenue Code was enacted. These rules enable a supporting organization, in effect, to derive its public charity status from its relationship to the publicly supported public charity or charities. Section 509A3 status has become an important public charity classification that is relied on by many parent corporations in complex structures, such as nonprofit hospital or healthcare systems. In addition, many universities and churches form these types of organizations to manage their endowment funds. Section 509A3 supporting orgs may also undertake more active programs for or on behalf of their supported organization such as owning and operating an office building or other real property, or carrying out a program where limiting liability to protect the supported organization is an important risk management goal. Before I do this dive into the supporting org tests, I want listeners to keep in mind that supporting organizations are still subject to the general requirements that apply to all public charities, that is, the rules that apply under Internal Revenue Code Section 501c3. All of the requirements we talk about here in this episode relate only to whether the charity is not a private foundation because it meets these special rules. Also, keep this in mind. Despite the apparent attractiveness of public charity status under 509A3, these rules do have drawbacks. The operational test does affect the types of activities and programs that a supporting organization may conduct. The supporting org structure is also somewhat complex to manage. Also, there are some limits that affect the ability to attract certain kinds of contributions. Finally, there is a higher regulatory and reporting burden on supporting organizations as compared to other types of public charities. Some additional minor notes before diving into the details of the four tests. I want to mention here that tax-exempt organizations that are not described in 501c3 sometimes establish a separate entity through which exclusively charitable activities are funded and conducted. These funds, trusts, or corporations created by non-501c3 organizations 
can receive their funding from the supporting organization, or they may directly solicit charitable contributions, gifts, and grants. A supporting organization that's established by a social welfare organization, a labor organization, or a trade association, that is a 501c4, c5, or c6 exempt organization, and also satisfies the usual organizational and operational requirements of 501c3, that supporting org may also qualify as a supporting organization, even though its sponsoring or supported organization is not a public charity. Let me clarify that. What I'm talking about here are supporting organizations that are set up to support a C4, C5, or C6. The rules for this type of structure are complicated, and listeners interested in these rules may want to check out the show notes for links to applicable regs. The important point here I'm trying to make is that supporting orgs can be established for other than public charities, but there are special rules, and it's good to know that this is a possible avenue for social welfare, trade associations, and labor organizations. Finally, I want to note here that supporting orgs can be organized and operated to support a foreign rather than a domestic charity, so long as the foreign entity that's supported otherwise meets the requirements for public charity status under U.S. rules. Type 1 and Type 2 supporting orgs can support these foreign entities. However, a Type 3 supporting org can't be used when the supported organization is not organized in one of the United States. So, with these relatively minor caveats out of the way, here's an overview of the four rules that apply to supporting organization structures. First, the organizational test. A supporting organization must be organized exclusively for the benefit of, to perform the functions of, or to carry out the purposes of one or more specified 509A1 or 509A2 organizations. For a discussion of the public charity classifications that meet these requirements, that is the 509A1 and A2 rules, check out episode five of this podcast. I'm not going to go into great detail in the public charity requirements for the supported organization. Here, we're just talking about the rules for the supporting organization. Back to the rest of the four tests. The second test for the supporting org test is the operational test. This test states that a supporting organization must engage solely in activities that support or benefit its supported organization. Test number three, the control test. Here, this test says disqualified persons may not control a supporting organization directly or indirectly. In addition, type 1 and type 3 supporting organizations may not receive gifts from persons who control the governing body of the supported organization or from certain related individuals or entities. And the fourth test, the relationship test. A supporting organization is classified as a type 1, type 2, or type 3 supporting organization based on the type of relationship it has with its supported organization. Type 3 supporting organizations have a further subset functionally integrated, and non-functionally integrated, which have very different rules. So that is our roadmap for this episode. We're going to dive a little deeper into each of these four tests. Diving into test number one, the organizational test. The organizational test has several parts. The first requirement of the organizational test is a purpose requirement. Generally, this requires that the organization's articles of incorporation or trust instrument, if created as a charitable trust, must provide that the entity is organized, and I'll quote from the statute here, quote, for the benefit of, to perform the functions of, or to carry out the purposes of, end quote, one or more specified publicly supported organizations. Although the regs do not require the use of the specific words, that is, for the benefit of, to perform the functions of, or to carry out the purposes of, in the organizational documents, drafters should use one of these phrases when possible. This is important because the mere fact that the organization happens to support a public charity will not be sufficient to meet the test. You'll have much smoother sailing with the IRS if these specific phrases are quoted in an attempt to meet the organizational test. The degree of specificity required in the documents also depends on the type of relationship the supporting organization has with the supported organization. If it intends to be a Type 1, operated, supervised, or controlled by, or a Type 2, that is, supervised or controlled in connection with, then the purposes clause is allowed to be similar to but no broader than the purposes set forth in the organizational documents of the supported organization. 
But for a type three organization aiming for the looser operated in connection with relationship test, more precision is required in the supporting organization's organizing documents. That is typically the articles of incorporation. Another critical element of the organizational test is that the organizational documents must specify by name or class the organization or organizations it will be supporting. And here also the degree of specificity required depends on whether it's a type 1, 2, or 3. If type 1 or 2, then the names of the supported organizations don't have to be specified, but can be identified by class or purpose. This is allowed for type 1 and 2 because the supported organizations are sufficiently in control of the supporting organization so that the organization will not benefit other entities without the approval of the supported entities. A type 3 supporting org, though, is subject to stricter organizational requirements in its organizing documents. Generally, the type 3 supporting org must designate the organizations it supports by name, that is, specific organizations. So, moving on to test 2, the operational test. The operational test limits the supporting organization to activities that support or benefit the supported organizations. In fact, the rules require the supporting organization to operate exclusively for the benefit of its supported organizations. The regs are specific in stating that a supporting organization will meet this test only if it engages solely in activities which support or benefit the publicly supported organizations. This can include making grants or carrying out activities or both grants and direct activities, but always and only to support the supported organization. If the supporting organization has as its principal function grant making, it needs to either pay over its income directly to one or more of the supported organizations or to other organizations supported by them, or to make payments to or for the benefit of individual members of the charitable class benefited by the supported organizations. The supporting organization can carry out an independent activity or program that supports or benefits the supported organization or provide services or facility to the charitable class. The operational test will be satisfied if, for example, the supported organization directly conducts activities on behalf of the supported organization or if it takes over different functions for the benefit of the supported organization. A good example of this is, say, a risk management function that the supporting organization can do in support of the parent entity. Other typical activities of supporting organizations are ancillary business functions, other programmatic activities, operating related businesses to raise funds for the supported organizations, or other similar types of activities. Next up, test number three, the control test. There are two tricky rules here. First, the basic rule for supporting organizations of any type is that the supporting organization cannot be controlled directly or indirectly by disqualified persons other than foundation managers and public charities. Disqualified persons for this purpose includes substantial contributors to the supporting organization, their family members, and related entities. In other words, care must be taken that the board of the supporting organization is not controlled directly or indirectly by substantial contributors to it. Second, for types 1 and 3, there's a relatively recent addition to the rules that prevents donor manipulation of the structure. This rule provides as follows. The supporting organization is prohibited from accepting gifts from any person who directly or indirectly controls the supported organization, either alone or together with related persons and entities. In other words, a donor who controls the supported organization cannot make contributions to the supporting organization. For both of these rules I'm talking about under the control test, related persons include ancestors and descendants and their spouses, as well as corporations, partnerships, or trusts or estates in which the control person or the identified donor owns more than 35% of the total voting power of a corporation, 35% of the profits interest of a partnership or LLC, or 35% of the beneficial interests in a trust or estate. Moving on to the final test, the relationship test. In order to qualify as a supporting organization, the entity must meet one of the relationship tests. This is where the organizations are distinguished between types 1, 2, and 3. To meet the relationship test, the supporting organization must demonstrate a special relationship with one or more public charities, 
The big idea here is that the entity must show a relationship to make sure that the supporting organization is in fact responsive to the needs or demands of one or more public charities and that the supporting organization will be an integral part of or maintain a significant involvement in the operations of one or more supported organizations. How they meet this relationship test falls under one of these three types, each of which has special rules. So for a type one relationship, we're meeting the operated, supervised, or controlled by relationship. Type one, the operated, supervised, or controlled by relationship requires the presence of substantial direction by the supported organization over the conduct of the supporting organization's governance. This test contemplates that the supported organization will give direction over the policies, programs, and activities of the supporting organization. This test for a type 1 entity reflects the typical parent subsidiary structure. For example, the supported organization is the sole or controlling member of a supporting organization or appoints, designates, or elects at least a majority of the directors, trustees, or officers of the supporting organization. Type 2 is a little bit looser. The type 2 test is referred to as supervised or controlled in connection with relationship. The type 2 test can be met if both the supported org and the supporting organization are under the common supervision or control of the same persons. At a minimum, a, a majority overlap of the persons controlling the two entities is generally necessary. For example, The executive officers of the supported organization may also be ex officio directors or officers of the supporting organization. This type 2 structure might be attractive when planting separately incorporated activities in different geographic regions, for example, where common control is important. The type 3 supporting organization structure is the operated in connection with relationship. In the type 3 relationship, neither organization controls the other, and no person or entity controls both the supported and supporting organization. This type of relationship has two components, known as the responsiveness test and the integral part test. The responsiveness test is designed to make sure that the supported organization has the ability to influence the supporting organization, and the integral part test ensures that it will have the motivation to do so. So that's all for this episode. In the next episode, I'll go into more depth on the Type 3 supporting organization requirements, so stay tuned for that. I'm Cynthia Rowland, and you've been listening to EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferrella Braun & Martel. If you have suggestions for topics you would like for us to discuss, please email us at eoradioshow at fbm.com. That's eoradioshow at fbm.com. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, make a difference.